What I said on Wednesday was that historians, by training, by our disposition, by our temperament, uh, we necessarily attack, and I mean attack intellectually, critically, um, any set of practices, beliefs, institutions that claim to be timeless, natural, or universal. And as I said on Wednesday, we bring this approach to virtually everything we talk about, whether we're talking about the history of sexuality, the history of emotion, uh, the history of holidays, the history of the family, the history of anything that you can argue, oh, that's just how it's always been, or that's just part of human nature. Anytime we hear that, our alarms go off, and that's when we begin freaking out. And that's when we begin saying, no, we have to find the specific time and the specific place where this set of practices, this set of beliefs came to be institutionalized, came to be naturalized, found legitimation in the law, in culture, in social practice. We need to locate things in historical time and historical place no more, uh, with no more urgency than in those moments I should say, with, with greatest urgency in those moments when certain things are deemed to be inevitable or sanctioned by God or sanctioned by nature and ultimately uncontestable. Right? It seems to me, as I said, if we're thinking about this as a class in the history of power, right, one of the greatest exercises of power, and this is true in the economic realm, in the social realm, in the political realm, anywhere, and one of the greatest ways you exercise power is to say that the thing that you do, the way that you act, the practices that you engage in are simply normal. And that whatever people, other people do, those are deviant, those are unnatural, those are somehow outside of the scope of what's normal. The ability to normalize, to claim as natural, to claim as inevitable what it is you are or what it is you do is really the place that power happens in a society. Sometimes it's enforced with guns, sometimes it's simply enforced through public discourse. But regardless, any time that a set of practices is deemed to be incontrovertible, inevitable, this is where historians have to step up and enter into the fray. And that's what we'll be doing over the course of this semester. Now what I want to devote our time to today is thinking about why capitalism, why this, as opposed to any number of other ways of talking about the economy in the modern era, uh, should be the subject of our course. Why should we apply this particular label to the subject of our investigation? I mean, couldn't we as easily call this class the history of globalization? Could we call this class the history of the modern economy? Could we call this class the history of uh, the industrial financial complex? We could go down the list, the history of market culture, uh, with a, a nod to our friends over in the political theory project, we could call it the history of prosperity. Right? Um, there are lots of different choices that we can make. So why on earth are we using the C word? Why are we talking about capitalism? We could still call this, well, is, shouldn't this be called the history of commodification and financialization? Well, maybe, but I think that those terms come together in a meaningful way under something called capitalism. And I think we have to find, call it capitalism for the same reason that we always have to avoid speaking euphemistically. Right? I think there's a, a, an imperative to name the system, right? not to speak of the free enterprise system, recognizing all of that that may potentially obscure or all the debates that may work within there, uh, to recognize that words like free themselves are not stable, not universally applicable, um, that in fact using a term like the economy, which might be another possibility here, again is in essence a cop out. Right? When we talk about it as the economy, we simply are talking about it like it's the weather. Mm -hmm. Something that exists outside of us that we have no control over and that just basically is. Um, and when we call it that, right, we make it natural. Uh, we remove culture, we remove the state, we remove epistemology, we remove basically all contestations over power. And if in fact we want to as responsible scholars, and I might even argue as responsible citizens, engage in understanding how the world works in the most explicit terms of who has power and who does not, right? then we have to name the system. We have to call it something real. We have to call it something concrete. And the term that we have at our disposal to do so is capitalism. And again, that doesn't mean that we're going to use capitalism pejoratively and we've really, you know, that that term is, is in the custody of people who, who, who dislike the word and dislike the system. But we have to use the word capitalism simply because it is a real specific set of institutional arrangements 
that don't involve or that doesn't necessarily involve every single market that's ever existed. It doesn't involve every single society that's had inequality. It doesn't necessarily convey every single place in which there's been buying and selling or, or, or lending and borrowing. But it applies to a specific set of configurations of all of these things, of buying and selling, of lending and borrowing, of organizing culture and organizing politics that emerged over the last 500 years in specific historically knowable ways.